Hello, everybody. Okay, it's my great honor and privilege to be introducing the second round of quickfire presentations. And we're going to get straight started with what's new in Test Stand 2021. And I'm honored to join to the stage Carlos, who's going to take us through that. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Welcome to What's New in Test Stand 2021. My name is Carlos Gonzalez, and I'm the product manager for Testan. Just let me take a moment to recognize Margaret Hamilton. She and her MIT team produced software for the Apollo project, founded two software companies, and published more than 130 papers, which was kind of wow, at least for me. She received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama for that work on the NASA Apollo moon missions. So definitely a role model to follow. So what's new in Testan 2021, the latest release? We did an overhaul of the sweet loop step. A sweet loop step allows you to define a set of test vectors or parameters and a block of steps to loop over. As the sweep goes through the parameters that were provided, the current values are stored in local variables that you can use in module calls or other steps. When configuring a sweet loop step, once you specify a parameter, test and will automatically create variables and fill the appropriate fields, as you can see in the slide. And we're gonna see a demo of this. You have more control on how parameters interact. They can work in parallel or they can be nested. You can also specify the strategy type. You can choose a static for you specify custom values, or you can set a dynamic where the values are controlled by expressions. We also have a table view for better interaction with test vectors. In this view, you can unselect everything and then you can produce one if you want to debug that case or you want to see how it works. So that's more flexibility. And you can now import and export parameter and test vector that are using CSV files. So I had test them right here with me. I'm gonna do a quick demo of these new capabilities. So I'm gonna drop a sweet loop step and then I'm gonna add a new parameter. Let's call this one current. Then a local variable was automatically created and also this field was updated. So I'm gonna say that this variable begins at 0 0.01. It will stop at 0 0.1. And the step of the increment 0 0.01. We had now 10 values. I'm gonna add another parameter. Let's call this one voltage. Then I'm gonna edit of these values for voltage. I want this to begin on. I want this to stop at 10. I want the hit step to be one. Again, I have 10 values. Also, I want to show you that here you can choose, okay, I want this to be dynamic. You can set expressions, but let's keep this static. So we have now the tell you oh, view here. As you can see, we have these two parameters or test vectors working in parallel, which basically means you can get one value for each parameter as we to iterate. So we have 10 iterations, one value each. Let's say I want this, you know, I want this to be nested. And then I'm going to update this. And now I have for each value of current, that we iterate, then I want to iterate through for the other 10 values of voltage. Now I have a hundred iterations. As I mentioned, you can say, on maybe set a specific iter uh, iterations you want to try. Maybe you're debugging something or you want to see a specific one, how it works. So you have more control. So that's about it for the demo. Uh, let me continue. 
as usual, you can see what's new in the release notes on any version. We also include reference to what was introduced in previous version of test time. And thank you very much. That's all I have for today. Amazing. Thank you very much, Carlos. It's um, always great to see these brand new features uh, being introduced. And I look forward to trying them myself. OK. Um, next up, we have Michael. Now, Michael's going to be talking to us about uh, different tips and techniques uh, beyond, um, uh, so in Git, uh, beyond just a simple merge. So, Michael, take it away. Hello, I'm Mike, and I would like to show you that there is more in Git than just Git. Since several years, we see that the group of Labian tests and developers who use Git as their source code management tool grows rapidly. One of the key factors here is the abundance of implementations and the easiness of setup. There are ready-to-use web-based Git providers like Assembla, Bitbucket, GitHub, or GitLab. Moreover, some of those offer affordable licenses to spin off systems in private cloud like AWS or Azure, or to run them on-premises with pre-configured Docker containers. Just few clicks and the whole system is running. Those systems cover not only basic Git-related features like web interface for repository management, but also some extras like web ID or CI-CD integrations. Today, I'd like to present you one of them that you may start to use now and you will see benefits nearly immediately, a merge request. Merge request, also called pull request, is a process or a workflow that is not a feature of the Git itself. It is rather a ceremonial execution of Git merge command. This that uh, is included in most Git providers. Merge request facilitates a space for feedback about the code changes and enables a code quality gateway. Let me tell a short story. There is a project Joe works on and he's requested to implement a new feature. Branch is created, Joe pushes his comments there, but there was also some development in the main branch. While working alone, that's not a problem at all. But if Joe works with a team, that may not be so simple. First of all, at this moment, some code review will be appropriate to make sure that the Joe did uh, that what Joe did fulfills requirements and it's uh, compliant with in-house coding guide. So Joe calls senior developer Sam for a quick review and makes it by sharing screen over Teams. The code was not so bad as you see, and Joe gets only two issues to fix it, uh, and he notes it down on a post-it card. Back to work, code fixed. Even though John has lost one of the post-its, but Joe is sure that he is done. Is it a time for a merge? Not really. It's a time to call Sam for yet another review. So how good a developer can be at tracking those two issues? What is more, will Sam remember what he exactly meant during the quick disruptive call review a few days ago? In sunny day scenario? Yes, of course. But otherwise, we may end up in scope creep or compromised code quality. Have you seen that happen before? Those are the issues that merge request process addresses. Therefore, I will show you a small demo. I'm using GitLab and I have selected a GLA 2021 project and its graph view. There, I have a similar situation as in the story. I need for a merge. So instead of an ad hoc review, let's create a proper merge request by clicking here and create new merge request. First, we select which branch we want to merge into main. Then we see a pretty fine uh, name of the, of the merge. And um, there, is, there is a description of work to be done. Here it is good to be rather elaborative on what uh, the implemented change is. It will, be, it will give the reviewer a clear view of the content of the change and its alignment with initial task. But for the case of the presentation, let's just write here quick fix. We need to select the assignee. Assignee is the one who will be responsible for handling the first review. Not the reviewer, but the ones who will answer the, the issues. And reviewer. That will be a test reviewer. Here are some other, other features used when GitLab is used as an issue tracker. We don't use them. And here are some other merge options. For example, delete source branch. I'll not use this one here. Let's create a merge request. Now, the reviewer was notified by email that there is a review waiting for him. So let's head to reviewer's view. And let's refresh it. 
first we see a checkpoint in here on the to-do list, which leads us to the merge request. Here, reviewer may read this detailed description and can start a review by inspecting locally checked out files from a particular branch. For each problem he notices in the source code, he may start a separate thread to describe it. So let's find a problem one and create a thread and find a problem two and start a thread. Developer is notified about unresolved threads by email, so let's navigate to his view. Here we see that there are two unresolved threads, and they uh, and their descriptions are in two separate uh, threads. Developer can now fix and commit code that addresses each issue individually, as well as provide additional comments to uh, to the reviewer. Let's assume that this problem is fixed in commit 123 and let's add a comment now and this uh, this uh, problem is uh, unsolvable reviewer is notified about comments so let's again check what the reviewer will see so now with comments and comments from developer Reviewer may choose to resolve the thread, each of them separately. And again, developer is notified about threads being resolved individually. Let's head back to the developer's view. Now, developer will see that all threads are resolved and finally he can proceed with a merge. Yes, it's merged and done. So, even though it initially uh, may have looked like a very formal process, but when adopted and executed frequently, it may, may make sure to make your team better in code quality, knowledge sharing, and it will increase chances to spot bad practices. It also promotes work style with less coworker distractions and context switching. I strongly encourage you to check merge request process yourself. Thank you. Amazing, thank you. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Mike. Okay, up next we have a double act. We have Cartiff and Phil. They're going to be taking us through the secret source of using PPLs or packed project uh, libraries. They're something I use on a regular basis. So I'm hoping to learn a few tips and tricks. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. There you go. Hi, everybody. So, Karthik here. So, I'm very happy to talk about LV Solution Builder, something that greatly helped me in one of my recent projects. So, I am joined by Phil from NI, and he's the core architect and developer of the LV Solution Builder. So, yeah. So, let's get started. So, I'll be going over a short uh, demo of this uh, how lv solution builder helps with ppl and phil will be available in the chat for answering any questions that you might be having so feel free to put, post your questions in the chat window okay so let me start with uh, this basic question so what is a ppl so ppl stands for pack project library so they are project libraries that package multiple files into a single file so they have this LV libp file extension. So yeah, this definition seems somewhat similar, right? So that's what LLB does. But there are some different key differences between LLB and PPLs. LLBs are editable, while PPLs are compiled code, something like a DLL and are not editable. And the next major difference is PPL supports folder hierarchies to be maintained, while LLBs don't. In LLB, you have all the VAs in flat. So if you have two VAs with the same name, that will be a problem. Whereas in PPL, that is not the case. And LLBs are somewhat legacy and was created during LabVIEW 8.3. And there are some issues where if one file inside the LLB gets corrupted, the entire LLB gets corrupted. So these are some of the major differences between an LLB and a PPL. 
and as a PPLs also support excluding its dependent PPLs outside. So you you don't need to package everything and all its dependencies into a single file. You can if you want you can make the dependent sites to go outside the PPL file. So which is great for plugin deployments. And generally I prefer PPLs over LLBs, and they are a great way of implementing plugin support to a live executable and they have other advantages as well. So they are a compiled binary. It's a few files to deploy when compared to source distribution and it reduces the build time of a big monolithic application if you break them down into smaller PPLs because those compiled code doesn't need to be compiled every time you rebuild the entire application. So, yeah. So let me start with an example project here. So I have one uh, instrument manager and basically what it will try to do is it will try to load the different instrument child classes present in a particular plugins folder and just mention the list of child classes it has found. So this works currently in source code. So let's see what all the steps that we need to do to get the same experience in EXE. Okay, so let me, so this is my starter code. I'll make a copy of it. Let's start the normal route. This is the my project file. Okay, so I have this load instrument plugins. And if you see here, I just have a VI where I try to get the list of classes which is present in a plugins folder and I just load it up using factory pattern. And here I'm just then listing the list of child classes that has been loaded. So now if I just run this one. I get two child classes because I have two child classes present here. Okay. So this works in source code. Now, uh, so basically now in case if I want to add a new child class, I just have to create a class and put it inside the plugins folder. I don't need to touch the, the main VI, the load instrument plugins or the instrument manager for this to work. But if you want the same experience in EXE, there are a few more additional things that we have to do. We, if we just simply build this into an exe this will not work like a plugin because all these uh, parent class will go inside the exe child class will not go inside and even if you put it inside the parallel there are a few bunch of dependencies you have to manage so there will be some confusions there so now let's see what we need to do to make this ppl or a plugin compatible so to start with i will have to build the parent ppl so basically it can creates the parent class library into a PPL. So now once that is done, LabVIEW has this nice option of replace with. So if you just right click a library, there will be this replace with option where you can replace the library with its corresponding PPL. So I'll just choose replace with. Let's go parent, no, okay. This instrument parent, yeah. So I just save this. So now once the parent class library has been replaced with the PPL, you can now go ahead and rebuild the PPLs for the child classes and the instrument manager. So let me start and go and do that. Okay. Now the same process I have to repeat for these three as well. I have to replace these libraries with the PPL versions. So right click, replace with. So this is done. Now I have to do repeat the same process for the child classes as well. Okay. So now all done. All the PPLs have now been built. Now I can build the EXE. Okay, let me go and run this. If I did the whole process well, this should now be able to load the classes dynamically. Yeah, it works. So basically, whatever plugins I'm placing here, those are getting loaded into the, by the exe. So since they are PPLs, it has their own list of dependencies. So in future, if you, even let's say if you are using a new uh, open source library like uh, JKI or OpenG, which was not part of the original EXE, they would still work. In case if you're not deploying it as a PPL and if you're just pasting the class object class inside the plugins folder, 
it will not find the dependency inside the EHV due to which it will be broken. So that is the reason why you have to go for PPLs. But there are a few disadvantages as well, I would say. Like for example, now if you open your source code, you can't actually see what is in the block diagram. Because it's a compiled version, right? Even in your source code, you are using the compiled version of the library. That means the block diagram is hidden and blocked for you. And uh, let's say for some reason, the code is not working like now in source code. It will be a bit difficult for you to debug and you have to find dependencies like uh, now you have replaced all the libraries with the PPL. Now you have to go and create a separate project file for each of these PPLs and create the build specifications. And after building those um, PPLs, we have to copy it and paste it in. Uh, let's say, for example, if you're rebuilding the parent, then you copy the PPL and paste it in the child's workspace for to rebuild the child. So there are a few bunch of things that you have to handle. So the reason why it's not working here in source code is I know because the path is not correct. In case if you give the correct path, it will work. So let me do that. So yeah, this is the plugins directory. So once I give the PPL directory, it works. Okay. So now we did a whole bunch of things, right? What if wouldn't it be awesome if we are able to just do all those things without manually going and making all these changes and also keep the source code completely open. So that our savior comes in, which is the LV solution builder. So LV solution builder is an open source tool created by Phil Joffrey. So it's under the MIT license, which is a permissive license and can be used in commercial applications as well. And it supports LabU 2019 and higher one. So let me do the redo the same process with Solution Builder. Let me. So I go with the, the same starter code. Okay, so this just contains the same source code that whatever we saw. Now let me open up the solution builder. So does the solution builder, the only thing that you have to give us the source code directory path. Once you do that, it does a lot of amazing. Okay, yeah, source. So once I give this source, what does this? It able, it's able to identify the list of projects that is present in the directory. It is able to identify the list of build specifications. And more than that, it is able to identify the dependencies between these build specifications and orders the build specifications in the right order so that the first the parent class gets built, then the child classes get built. So how many other interdependencies you have, it will be able to order the order of sort them out, and then it will build one after the other. So now, yeah, by the time I'm explaining, it's already done. Let's go and see how the build code is. Yeah, so we have the exe and we have the plugins and inside the plugins, we have the child class PPLs. Now let's go ahead and run the exe. Yep, it works. And more importantly, the key advantage is now if you open post code directory, right? The code is completely still open. So it is like a normal lab view project that you're having. You don't need to deal with PPLs in source code at all. The PPLs only gets built during the build process and that will be available as a plugin in source code. This code is completely open. You can go and see whatever code is wherever you want. It will be very easy to debug because in development, you want the code to be open, right? That is why it will be easy to develop debug test. So the solution builder maintains that key advantage and still provides the advantages of PPL during build process. Yep. So yeah, those are the key advantages. Greatly improved developer experience, easier debugging, block diagram is completely open in source code, and uh, you don't need to maintain separate workspaces for the, each of the PPLs, automatically decides the build order, and it even has the intelligence to skip building a component if there is no change, code change present. So yeah. So those are the key things. So do let us know in the comments on whether you have used PPLs or whether you have encountered any issues with PPLs. If you are using PPLs, I would strongly recommend you to try this open source tool out. It has greatly helped me and I would like to add this with everybody. Yeah, thank you.
Amazing. Um, thank you, you two. Anything which helps uh, speed up my development or automate my um, PPL build process is great news I'm a, and I'm a huge fan of that. So thank you for your presentation. For our next presentation, I'm actually going to be sharing a recording of um, my presentation from 12 hours ago when the GLA Summit started. And this presentation is all about our giants are female. So, pass Tom, take it away. Okay, so for our next um, presentation, I am extremely sorry to say that I'm going to be talking for um, a little while. Um, and the, the topic I want to speak about is our giants are female. You may notice that throughout this conference and through other LabVIEW based conferences like uh, GDevCon or the CLA summits, we have hashtags of our giants are female. This, um, this initiative is based on the quote from Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton, if, if I have seen further, it is only because I am standing on the shoulders of giants. This particular initiative was brought to the LabVIEW community really through Fabiola de la Cueva, who's instrumental through our LabVIEW community. She's, I'm sure she's here hiding in the background somewhere, um, but she's been a great help and a bit more about her later. But this was her um, suggestion. So here's an idea and it's not mine. Um, when we go to technical conferences, let's encourage other presenters to begin their presentations by talking about a woman in tech for a couple of minutes. The idea being that the more we can normalize, the more we can encourage um, diversity within conferences, encourage more people, we are going to get uh, much better results. We learn much more through others. And as Sam Taggart just mentioned, fab is just short for fabulous. As Fabiola would say, she's fabulous and modest. Um, I think it was also Steve Watts who, um, who was talking through uh, who was talking with Fabiola about this hashtag. And the key thing that I want to stress here is we are only experts in our own mindset. I'm an expert in what I think, you're all experts in what you think. So it's really important that we educate ourselves by listening to others, trying to learn with an open mind. Now, I'm not an expert. I don't know the right things to say at all times, but here are some good um, suggestions of where to start. If you go to codelikeagirl.io with the punctuation between code and like a girl, you will find Fabiola's article, which gives some background as to why we are promoting the Our Giants Are Female um, hashtag. Also on that website, there, there's tremendous suggestions of how we on this conference, speaking candidly, are predominantly white men, how we can be better allies in the workplace and through life. There's an entire section on the website of how we can adopt everyday actions to be better allies. Now, my, I initially became very invested in, in this initiative and other initiatives because I teach at a lot of primary schools. So this is just an image of me teaching um, about learning from nature at a local primary school. So all of these children are between the ages of six and 11. About. And at this age, you know, everyone is asking questions. Every, every child here was asking me questions. And from this image, you can see that we have one, two, three, yeah, three out of the four children here are girls. Something is happening between this age and growing up to, which is preventing women from joining STEM. And that's a, that's a great shame. Um, but, but I said that one of the questions which one of these girls asked, um, which I found quite challenging. So I work in neuroscience research and one of these girls asked me the question, how do you keep the animals alive when you're imaging their brains? 
Um, and I must admit, that was quite a difficult question for me to answer. Um, but I answered it uh, anyway. Um, so this is where my motivation comes from. I, I love going into primary schools and teaching children about STEM, mathematics, engineering. Um, but slightly older than these school children are these great women that we have in our community already. When I was putting together these, this slide deck, I tried to think about who has impacted the way that I develop code on a day-to-day -day basis. And these five women immediately came to mind. We have Fabiola de la Cueva, who we all know is a legend in the LabVIEW community. She promoted this initiative, which is um, great. But more than that, more personally, Fabiola has been a great mentor to myself. She's, uh, <laughs> I shall see her in the chat window. She's been very encouraging for me to like put myself forward with my YouTube channel and um, do events like this. Fabiola is the reason why I do an awful lot of scripting. I even ventured into uh, project providers. Fabiola would never promote using a project provider, but the behind the scenes is all scripting. It's all amazing. Next, we have Hope Harrison. If you have never used pain relief, Go on to VIPM, search pain relief, and it will revolutionize the way that you create your user interfaces. With pain relief, the tool which Hope Harrison created, you can rename your pains, rename your splitters. You can have a zero pixel splitter, which is amazing. My mind was blown. Um, you can obviously move splitters dynamically and lock them. Um, yeah, great work, Hope. Next, we have Danny Job. If you've been to, I don't know, uh, NI Days or NI Week, CLA Summit, you may have seen Danny present. You um, also, I've been watching a lot of her presentations, particularly with Ducks Love, where she's been promoting other um, user interface techniques. Next up, we have Nancy Hinson, who is actually going to be giving the um the keynote of this conference in uh, a couple of hours i need to check the agenda but yes yeah, stick around for nancy's um nancy's presentation is going to be great and again nancy is one of the great presenters which we which we see very often um at the cla summit and lastly not many of you may know uh danny george or daniela george i should say professor Danny George. Um, she's a professor at uh, Manchester University. I believe she's the dean of uh, one of the engineering faculties, but she has also been the president of the Institute of Engineering and Technology here in the UK. I've had the pleasure of meeting her several times when I worked at National Instruments. And again, she's a great ally of promoting diversity within STEM. And it's an honor that I've been able to speak with all of these individuals. Now, I wanted to invite some other people um, up on stage. So I want to invite Michael uh, back on stage to speak about one of the women who have uh, really influenced him. So over to you, Michael. Hello. Yes, I would like to say that our giants are female and our giants are not only in our professional life. Monica is my primary school classmate, multi-talented, always interested in math and physics. It is her who made me to understand the basics of calculus. A few years later, she decided to go and study abroad. Now, with multiple patents and PhD in microelectronics from Yale University, Monica is both the CEO and the lead scientist of Slow Fluid Screen a biotech company developing microfluidic chips that can dis discriminate and count bacteria in, in fluid. She mastered three domains traditionally dominated by men, the academia, engineering, and the business, and she rocks at all three. I would like to make sure that you are seeing those women who are around you and make sure that they feel encouraged because they can really get the success that they have. Amazing. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, next up, I would like to invite 
uh, Cartif, um up on stage to speak about um, a woman who's been um, influencing him. Uh, thanks, Tom. Yeah. So I'm very happy to talk about Shaguntala Devi. So she's a very household name right during my childhood. So maybe I'll tell some of her achievements, which will make it more obvious. So in 1977, she actually found the 23rd root of a 201 digit number in 50 seconds. So that was something that was like completely unbelievable. And to actually verify that her answer was correct, a, a special program has to be created. And the, the thing was the program took more time than her to find that answer. So that was her mental ability in finding these mathematical puzzles. And in 1980, she entered the Guinness World Book of Records for finding the multiplication of two 13 digit numbers in 28 seconds. So the person who, the writer who actually discussed, saw that he described it as something that is phenomenon so that is something out of the world that only one word we can describe it as unbelievable and uh, yeah so google recently created a doodle uh, honoring her on her birthday so that is the doodle that you're seeing like a calculator they may also made a nice doodle honoring her and so she also wrote a book called figuring out the joy of numbers so that she had explained how she is able to uh, come up with the answers for some of these things. So there are like some tips where you can easily come up with a solution for it, for these mathematical numbers. So that is something that she has wrote and shared with everybody. And uh, yeah, so last year, actually a movie was made on her called Chaguntala Devi starring Vidya Balan and that is released in Amazon Prime. So yeah, she is a very household name that I've been figuring right from my childhood. And yeah, I just want to take this moment to talk about her. Yeah, thanks Tom. Okay, that brings us to the end of the uh, quick fire uh, session. You might have noticed that it's now night time here in the UK. Um, so 12 hours ago when I recorded that, it was uh, nice and sunny outside. But as Sam mentions, I am wearing the same shirt. Okay, we're going to have a bit of a break now until uh, what, well, for me, it's 1am, but for the next 10 minutes, and in 10 minutes time, Sam Rowdy's going to, sorry, Sam Rowdy's going to be giving his presentation on creating a test stand UI in LabVIEW. Okay, so explore the Hopin environment, get speaking to one, to one another in the networking tab, and I'm sure I'll see you, see you all around. Okay, cheers everyone.